Um, let's bow our heads as we get started. Father in heaven, we pray for your blessing upon our words. Uh, may your spirit be here to empower those words. Yeah, we, uh, we ask that we might have the grace and the strength to glorify your name and to bless everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the message <clears throat> that we are going to share with you today, uh, we have presented elsewhere um, in a number of places, but there was one church in particular that we pre presented it. At the time, I didn't think it was that big a deal, uh, but it was an email that Sandy received that made it clear that it had resonated in the heart of one particular individual in that church that Sabbath. Yeah, I was quite surprised when I got this email, and this is what the email said. I needed to share with you what happened this week and what your sermon meant to me. My husband and I have been separated for a week and a half now after being married almost six years. A bunch of little things added together along with a dash of pride on top equaled, I can't take it anymore, and I left. I came home to pick up the kids for Sabbath and take them to a hotel for the weekend, but decided to stay because he had made plans for us to go somewhere for a few days to mend things. I was reluctant. I had already begun apartment hunting and selling things to get out of debt and get some money in my hands because he has most of it, but I said yes for no other reason besides my love for him. So he took the kids to my mom's church and I went to your church and you too preached directly to me. Please pray for us. My heart is hard. I've been hurt a lot in my life and the first thing I do, the only thing I know how to do is run away. I want 33 years of me and my husband together like you, but I just don't know how to deal with this man. Thanks so much for the blessing of your sincere words today. I'm ready to recommit. And that was 10 years ago, and I'm happy to say that that couple stayed together, and they're doing very, very well. And I, we never would have dreamed that they had those kinds of problems at the time. So it was a blessing to think that, you know, we had helped somebody. We had saved a marriage and didn't even realize that was going to happen that Sabbath. You know, it seems hard for Sandy and I to believe, but this year we celebrate 44 years. Uh, we celebrate our 44th wedding anniversary. June 6th of this year, we've been mar married 44 years. I thought I'd throw this picture in here, and yes, that is me. <laughs> Everybody had long hair back then. Um, <laughs> my hair got considerably longer after that picture was taken, but uh, um, in that picture, you can tell I, I have a pretty good idea what I got. I think Sandy's still trying to figure out what she got. <laughs> <laughs> Considering that we started dating when I was 17 years old and we dated for two years and were engaged for two years, we have been together for better than two-thirds of our lives. I've told the story uh, a number of times that the day of our wedding, I went through the grandfather of all panic attacks. I was fine up to the day of the wedding. We had uh, come, my best man, my best friend and my best man for the wedding, had uh, come and stayin', stayed overnight in sleeping bags in a room at a church member's house in Norwich, Connecticut. And uh, Sunday morning I woke up and I rolled over. He was on the other side of the room and I rolled over and looked at him and said, Steve, I don't feel good. And I got up and went to the bathroom and promptly got sick. Somehow I got it into my head that I was making a mistake, but I couldn't think of a way out. Um, you have to understand, my father and my family had come from some distance to be there. My father thought the world of Sandy, and as terrified as I was of going through with the wedding, I was more terrified of his reaction if I didn't. Um, and I'm not sure what he would have done. I was kind of of the opinion that he might have killed me if I dared back out of this thing. So I was in the back room uh, before the wedding with my brother-in-law, Mark. Um, that's me. Uh, we had a, a friend, uh, I don't know whether you've heard of, um, oh, my mind's gone blank, what was his name? Brad Thorpe. Brad Thorpe. He's the, he's the head of uh, Hope Channel. Well, Brad Thorpe was working with Mark at the time when Mark was doing evangelism in, uh, Mass in southern New England. And uh, so Brad, as a, a wedding uh, present, uh, followed us around uh, the whole day shooting slides. And his gift, his wedding gift to us was three rolls of slides. But I'm in the back room, you know, just confessing everything I can think of to Mark, thinking that if I keep talking long enough, he'll say, wait a minute, I don't want you to marry my sister, and, and, and we're good, you know. And, uh, 
you know, but uh, he didn't. He didn't seem to back down. He, in fact, I asked him when we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary, and I and I had him. I'll tell you the story quickly, and that is that uh, I asked Sandy to marry me three times. First time she laughed at me. Second time she got mad at me. It took me the third time before she said yes. And so I went to her, uh, you know, on our when we got close to our 40th anniversary, and said, "Hey, you want to get married again?" And she said yes on the first time. So I said, "It gets easier." as you go along. <laughs> and so I asked Mark to marry us. And so I asked him, I said, did you know how scared I was? He says, man, I was the, I was the only barrier between you and the door out. <laughs> you know, apparently he knew, but he seemed to ignore me at the time and ignored everything I was telling him. You notice that in the two years of dating and the two years of being engaged in those four years, I did manage to clean him up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she did. <laughs> but anyway, um, I had no idea that he was ready to back out of the whole thing. But as I was walking down the aisle, his face was so serious that I was thinking in my head, did I do something to tick him off or something? Because I remember trying to figure out what was going on as I walked down, and he was just so stern looking. The, the, the truth is that when the door opened and Sandy and her dad stepped through the door, I started to cry. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. This is my favorite picture of her. You can't really, you can't see it much because the slides are old and fading. Yeah, but I was still scared, but, uh, and I was barely able to speak, but she was just so pretty I couldn't, couldn't walk away from that. So if you listen to the tape recording, and back in those days, um, you had you didn't have DVDs or anything like that. You had cassette players, if any of you remember that. But if you listen to that cassette, you hear the question being asked, Sandra Finley, do you take this man? And you hear a very clear, I do. And then you say, Eric Durand, do you take this woman? And you can hardly hear anything. So I, I hope we're married. <laughs> <laughs> what was, well, we are because we got married twice, remember, so we... So when what, we the did the 40, the yeah, we, we were, were double married. <laughs> yeah, it counts, doesn't it? Doesn't it count? You tell me, doesn't that count? You know, what was funny was that as soon as the service was over, I was fine. And so one of the pictures you can clearly, and you can clearly see in Brad's pictures, the one he took of us, you can see the before and after. Before the, before the wedding service, I'm not smiling much, I'm not saying much, except to Mark making all the confessions. But after the service is, is over, this is me. I'm fine. I'm fine. And nearly 44 years after the fact, it would have been absolutely catastrophic to have backed out. Uh, fear is not always a bad thing, you know. That's not to say that, that it has always been easy being married. Um, I've, I've been honest with you, and for those of you that haven't, didn't hear me talk about it, I grew up in a home where um, the abuse was um, pretty serious. Um, and the uh, we, in our home, there was just, there was no trust, there was no, there was a great deal of violence, there was a great deal of, of physical assaults. Um, I had very little trust for anybody because the person who said he loved me was the person that nearly beat me to death at the age of four. Um, so I had very little trust, and I had very little trust for Sandy early in, in our marriage. I would misjudge her motives, I would misread her words, I would assume the worst and, and get uh, defensive. And believe me, it's not like I was perfect or anything. You know, when two people come together, they bring their backgrounds with them. And I was used to coming home, and there was my grandfather sitting in his chair at the window. You know, so whenever I came home, I was like, he was supposed to be looking out the window and clapping and having a party because I walked in the door. Um, there was my mother always, you know, I was in this leave it to be their family, so I thought it was supposed to be like that. My mother always had the supper ready. I have a big brother and a big sister. If I needed any advice, any help, they were on it. I have a little sister always ready to play, do something, go out and have fun. My dad was an excellent storyteller, so he would come home with his Brooklynese accent and, and we would have great family dinners because he would tell these hilarious stories and, you know, it was always we sat down and he, dad would start with, and I said to him, I says. <laughs> So when I got married, I expected Eric to be all these people rolled into one. You know, my grandpa looking out the window for me, my mom making dinner, my little sister ready to go out and 
play tennis, my big sister, my big brother, all of this rolled into one. So that was pretty high expectation. Yeah. And by this point in time, I'm a Christian. Um, but there's still a lot of baggage that I'm dragging around with me. And, and that's the truth. I mean, we become Christians, we come to serve Christ, but there still has to be a lot of growing and a lot of changing. And at that point in my life, um, I'm still dragging around the baggage that came from the way that I was raised. And, and I believe that God uses the crucible of relationships to teach us about genuine love. Relationships in the home are where things get real and where you have to learn what love is really all about. You learn that it isn't just a feeling or an emotion, it's a principle. And it shapes our decisions and determines how we are going to live our lives. Relationships force us to think outside the circle of our own wants and needs to see the needs of another. Life isn't just about me anymore. It's about someone else. Love, love isn't just about me being loved. It's about me learning how to love. Now, God spells out how love is supposed to work in the Bible. Okay, we're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians 13, of course. And it starts out by giving a background of how important love is. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Who would have thought that anything could outclass the importance of faith? And we all know how important hope is. And yet Paul is telling us that the greatest of all these important traits of character is the trait of character called love. In nearly 44 years of our marriage, I've learned so much about what it means to love someone. I look back and think to myself how tragic it would have been if we had given up and stopped working to make it better. Now, I know that many have been given no choice in the fact that their marriage has ended. I promise you that God can bring healing to your heart, and he will teach you the lessons about love himself. The great lover of your soul will hold you in his arms and will lead you directly, will learn, and you will learn directly from him. And it's possible that you've had to exit a relationship. No one should ever have to put up with violence or abuse or the use of fear in a relationship. And I always look at my mother and wonder, you know, did she do the right thing by staying when some of the things that he did were so cruel? Others of you have had very strong and supportive relationships, but the passing of time has taken your loved one away from you. Hold on to the memories. Cherish the good times. Be aware of how deeply God has blessed you. For the married couples in the congregation to you, I'm sure that it's no news that marriage relationships take work. The, the good thing is, is that no matter where you are on that path, no matter which anniversary is coming up for you, whether it's the bronze or the silver or the gold, it's never too late to grow and improve in your relationship. And that's true of, I think, all relationships. Whether you're married or not, it never hurts to make an effort to tune in more deeply to how we are interacting with the significant people in our lives. To love someone is a journey of learning. 
It's a journey of learning and growth. It's not just emotional, but it's spiritual because as we learn how to love each other, I think we also learn a great deal on what it means to love God and to be loved by God. In almost 44 years of marriage, I've learned a lot. I've learned that the more unselfishly I give, the more unselfishly I receive. Uh, we spend far too much time worrying about our needs being met. And whenever I'm meeting with a couple and somebody starts talking about their needs not being met, it automatically alarms me that, that they may have missed the point here in the relationship. Um, it's not about just our needs being met. It's learning how to give, how to love. Love gives birth to love. And Jesus is our best example. He pours himself out lavishly for the sake of humanity. And there is an awakening in us, a longing to know the one who loves us so much. I have learned in almost 44 years of marriage that when I let go of the distrust and the doubt, when I decided that those things had to go, I wound up with a really good friend. And she even puts up with my weird collections and my weird idiosyncrasies. We're surrounded by antique telephones. And I can't stop. It's getting worse. No. It is. <laughs> we know each other well enough now that we can look across the room from each other. We don't even have to be sitting next to each other. And I can look at her and we start laughing because we know what I know what she's thinking and she knows what I'm thinking. I've learned a lot. I've learned to appreciate differences. You know, God makes you different for a reason. And um, I found this out actually very early in our marriage. We were going to have company. And I said to Eric, you clean the downstairs and I'll clean the upstairs. So I went in my type A thing and cleaned the whole upstairs. And probably the people were coming maybe in 10, 15 more minutes. And I went downstairs and I'm stepping over things. And I'm like, what is he doing? And I get to the kitchen and he had the knobs off the stove. And that stove was gleaming so much that you could see it two streets away. That stove looked so good. <laughs> so I learned that if there's an in-depth project, put him on it. You know, I had to appreciate that he's the more in-depth and I'm the one that just gets everything done quickly. So 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 do you have a slide on that? Oh, I do. I'm sorry. It's my fault. <laughs> okay. I got so into what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So it's nice to appreciate. And that's kind of what we were talking about this morning. People People are different, but that doesn't mean that somebody's wrong because they're different, and you need to supplement each other. Um, another thing I learned in marriage is maybe the thing that really bugs you about your spouse is actually the flip side of a positive trait that maybe is what attracted you to that person in the first place. You ever think about it that way? Whatever is bugging you, turn around and look at the positive side of that. So here's an example hot off the press. So last Sunday was a really pretty day, and I said, let's go for a bike ride and put the bikes in the back of the truck and go down by the ocean and take a bike ride. So then that was his job to get all the bikes in there. Uh, and we went down where there was a sidewalk by the water and we started riding our bikes. Well, it was a lovely day and we just kept riding. We were going for miles and he kept saying, you know, we really need to think about turning back. And I'm like, why does he always have to do that? <laughs> so finally I stopped after we were like seven miles out and I said, why do you keep wanting to turn around and go back? He said, well, there's a little part of my tire, and if it would happen to have a problem, then I have to walk my bike all these miles. All right, whatever, we're going back. Well, when we turned around, I realized that on the way, the wind had been in our back, so it had been just tooling along, you know. The so as soon as we turned around, oh my goodness, I'm pedaling. Uh, uh. So at that moment, I'm like, you know, it, it really is not a bad thing to be married to somebody that... <laughs> thinks of those kinds of details when I'm just flying around and doesn't even dawn on me that there could be a problem. Um, another thing, differences. Do, uh, do you think that in most families you have a collector and a tosser-outer? 
I'm just wondering, any, anybody here that likes to collect stuff? Okay, and anybody here that likes to throw stuff out? Okay, I love to throw stuff out. Like one of the, the best things I can do like a really good day is fill up my car and go to the thrift shop and just dump it. Like I just have this excited, exhilarating endorphin rush like somebody else is stuck with it now. And, and Eric's good day is to go to the thrift shop and get stuff. <laughs> Hopefully not the stuff I threw out. Um, but you know, I think that is biblical too because I started thinking about it. Did you ever read the part where they're building the temple and they have all these hides of sea cows that they're using for curtains? And I started thinking about well, where do you get the hide of a sea cow? And I started thinking, you know, when they were escaping, you know, from Pharaoh and his army through the Red Sea, I just had this mental picture of the husband saying, hey, look at that. And the wife is like, come on, we got to get through the Red Sea. And he's like, but yeah, but look at that hide of a sea cow. We may be able to use that someday. <laughs> so, you know, you have, to, you have to appreciate what is different, even though it could be a little irritating about the person. Uh, you know, I've learned to appreciate that Sandy in many ways lives for the moment. That's the bike ride. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't spend a lot of time obsessing over the mistakes of the past, which is a good thing since I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> And she doesn't spend a lot of time being anxious about the future. There is something to be learned. There's something to be learned about being at peace in the present. And I've learned to laugh more. I've learned enough to, to laugh at myself. You know, once you've come to the realization that your partner isn't looking for a fault to criticize, it becomes safe to laugh at your own blunders. We laugh a lot in our home. Um, a couple more things I've learned. You really do need the other person to balance you out, and I guess that's, that's the theme here. Um, but, you know, a number of years ago, we went to Italy, and we were walking around, and did you put a picture of the church we found? Yeah, so we were, we were off of the tour, and we saw this church was, you know, kind of this big church, but you could tell it was not one of the most important churches. You know, we kind of peeked in the door, and everything seemed to be peeling and in disrepair, yet they had these beautiful old frescoes and paintings. It was kind of interesting. Um, but as we opened the door, and it was a big, big place, like what, twice the size maybe? That's, or well, bigger than, probably four or five times the size of the sanctuary, yeah. easily. Yeah, so there was this old priest way at the other end, and we were standing there in the back, not knowing if we were supposed to be in there, and he had these slippers on, and he started very slowly, and, and my thing is, I'm a doer, so I thought at that moment, I need to decide. Either we need to go find out what's going on with the old priest, or we need to leave, one or the other. And I'm sitting there thinking, should we just get out of here? Are we not supposed to be in this church, or should we go ask that guy what's going on? So I stood there trying to think, and then I was surprised when I said, Eric, what should we do, stay or go? And he, he said, Sandy, just stand still. Wait and see what's going to happen. We're about to have an adventure. <laughs> you know, that hadn't even been an option to me, is stand there. You know, you got to do something at all times. <laughs> so we stood there, which was very hard for me, and it was an interesting experience we had because the old priest came up and he looked at Eric, he said, Italiano, and he said, no, Americano. But then the guy just kind of motioned very, very slowly in these slippers. Clip, 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 clip. And what it was, was that he had all of these potted plants that somebody must have sent to them. And they were too heavy because he was so old. They were too heavy for him to lift. And so he kept pointing to the plants and pointing where he wanted them. And, you know, it was meaningful because it wasn't part of a regular tour. And here we were in another country helping an old clergyman. And it never would have happened if I was in my take charge personality. Did, did you put a picture of that? Yeah, he's... Yeah, let's see if we can show he that. Finally, he finally said grazie to me and he went and sat down. <laughs> and uh, so I walked over and tapped him on the shoulder and said, and showed my camera and he, he, didn't he, want he a walked me the to sanctuary. the door. He walked me to the door and let me take my picture, let, a, let Sandy take our picture right there. Yeah, you know? yeah, he did not want a picture in the, in the sanctuary. Um, so, 
another thing I've learned from marriage is that if you bother to pay attention, you can actually learn a lot of things. You know, how many of you like tune the other person out when they get really technical, but sometimes I start saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I started figuring out that if I tune in, I could learn a lot about ham radios and dipoles and diesel engines and vacuum cleaner parts. And, you know, God didn't just put all the knowledge in one head. You know, God meant for us to learn from each other. He meant for our understanding of what it means to love to be refined in the crucible of relationships. The bottom line is that relationships take time. Sometimes relationships fail simply because people don't give them enough time. You have to work at it. And the rewards for persistence are worth the effort. If you're struggling in a relationship, we'll join the crowd. Relationship that never struggles probably isn't much of a relationship to begin with, but it's worth fighting for. You know, it's funny, I don't feel like I've been on the planet as long as I have. It's like, blink, all of a sudden you're the one that's older and wiser and giving all the advice. Um, but the one thing I do like about getting older is you start to get a perspective on things and you do start to realize, you know, in the long run, all things do work together for good. On our wedding day, we had a friend of ours sing a beautiful song and, and we had the words slightly changed. It's the words, it, the song was, Be Thou My Vision, and we had her sing it as Be Thou Our Vision. And it was just so beautiful by making the whole thing in the plural. And here I was there, 22 years of age, listening to Janice sing that song, and the third verse was so meaningful. Riches we want not, nor man's empty praise. Thou our inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in our hearts. High King of heaven, our treasure thou art. That's a beautiful thought and a beautiful song. May God be the center of your life, and may he richly bless all your relationships to grow in love. And as you learn more about your love for each other, may you also learn about God's love for you. Um, God is teaching us what it means to love, and that's really what it's all about. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't look at what I have and, and am absolutely amazed, A, at how how close I came to leaving and not getting married and, and, and second to just realize what a blessing God has given me that we, we stayed in there. God is going to teach you uh, and as you learn about the love that you have for the people around you and you begin to understand how to love them better, one of the surprises will be that you'll begin to learn a lot more about God's love for you and what that means. Father in heaven, we, we want to praise you and thank you for a love that's beyond anything we can understand. And we pray that your love will so fill our hearts and our minds that it will bring healing for those that are hurt today because relationships didn't make it, for those that have lost their loved ones, for those who are just hurting because things aren't going well. I pray that you'll give them a special strength and a, sp a special courage. Be with them, dear Lord. Help them to know that they are never, ever alone, that you are there to bring healing to their hearts and healing to their soul and healing to their mind. We give ourselves to you, and we pray, Father, that you will just teach us of your great love and that in that love, in that infinite love that we really can't even begin to understand, that you will help us to find the healing that we need. Bless us, Lord, we pray, and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.